So as, as uh, they talked about in that video, this, the paradox of obesity is that your, um, how does he say it? This is not a result of bad behavior. Um, your, your eating because of the, you're eating more because of the types of food you eat. Um, this is driven by what two authors, uh, Dr. Finney and Volk, refer to as the metabolic bully in their book, um, The Art and Science of Low-Carb Living. It's a really great book. Um, these are the same authors who wrote the new Atkins for a New You, which we're kind of using as our textbook. Uh, it's a little bit more detailed, um, and if you had a bit, have a bit of a healthcare background or an interest, I certainly encourage you to read through that. It's a good one as well. But they refer to this idea of insulin as a bully. It bullies around the rest of the immune system. And when it's, number, when it's high, when it's high in concentration, it forces your body to stay in what I refer to as energy storage mode. So this is the hormone obesity hypothesis, that you are hungry because of the types of food you're eating, um, that you have metabolic sickness. Does that make sense? OK. So you, you probably are gathering, as you're listening to me speak here, it's pretty simple. I see this as pretty simple. Uh, if you have a, a weight problem, you have blood sugar problems, you have metabolic syndrome or sickness, just don't eat sugar and starch. I'm done. See you guys later. Have a good night, okay? <laughs> no, because if you, if you get that, then we're done. Uh, there's a guy in the back of the room here, and I don't want to point him out. He won't be on camera, but we were just talking before this presentation. He came to one appointment with a friend, and was it 80 pounds? You don't have to say anything. Five minutes, because he got it. Sugar and starch, that's all he had to hear. I don't have to eat sugar, don't eat sugar and starch, lose weight, okay. And for some people, that's all it takes. This program, and I actually speak about this in the handbook, it's crystal clear to me. Don't eat sugar and starch. <laughs> so what's the purpose of the program? We're a support group, that's what we are. We're gonna support you as you follow this, because you know what? There's a lot of societal pressure out there to eat carbs, <laughs> right? They're in everything, and culturally, it's kind of what we do, you know? Some cultures are really, really found, their foundation is, is carbohydrates. And, and so that's fine. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going up against culture here. What I'm going up against is you've developed a medical problem and there's a clear solution to that medical problem. So if you want a solution to that medical problem, this is how we do it. We eat less sugar and starch. So it's that simple. So if it's that simple, why is it so complicated? Because we've been told our whole lives, it's complicated because we've been told our whole lives that it's eating fat that makes us fat. That's why it's complicated. Don't you lose weight by going on a low-fat diet. Has anyone ever been on a low-fat diet? Probably not. Probably none of you has ever been on a low-fat diet, right? No? Yeah, you guys, so you're new to this. Has anyone ever been on a low-fat diet? Can you give me a show of, show of hands? Okay. So, so definitely, definitely about, about a third of you have been on a low-fat diet before. You can, you've gone there. And, and may, I'm not going to say you didn't have success. I'm not going to assume you didn't have success. Actually, I assume that some of you did have success. Because as I interview people, I hear that people had success on their low-fat low diets for a period of time. Um, since the dawn of food guides, we've been telling people to eat less fat. Um, the rates of obesity and diabetes have been rising ever since. Uh, some who have come before me in, in terms of interest in low-carb have referred to this as a, an experimental diet. This low-fat diet is an experimental diet. And that resonates with me because, I don't know, as, as I kind of think through and, and learn a little bit more about what our, our ancestors might have eaten, the type of diet they may have had, this idea of cutting fat and increasing the sugar and starch composition of our food, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go there and say we are eating more sugar as we eat low-fat because you have to think of some of those low-fat products. You know what they have more of to make them taste good? Sugar, and therefore, it's not the food guide. I'm, I'm really, I have a hard time with. You know, I think the Canada's food guide is is a good. I'm going to say this is a good strategy for some people. The problem is when industry got involved and said you want less fat, no problem. We'll keep the flavor though. We're going to put sugar in, right? So low-fat products tend to be higher in sugar. And you'll see in our in our program guide, don't eat low-fat products. They are the worst thing you can eat. Okay, so experimental diet. Um, one in three Canadians are now pre-diabetic or diabetic. And so what is our response being to be? Being the government of Canada, the World Health Organization, these authorities are still saying, resoundingly, eat fewer calories. That's what you need to do. Eat fewer calories, exercise more, behave differently. <laughs> right? They're focusing on your behavior. 
um, they don't really seem to address this idea of metabolic sickness being an entity that drives people to eat in a certain way. And they certainly don't seem to address the idea of addiction. This low calorie thing, the other interesting thing about it is it, it, it puts all types of uh, macronutrients, the macronutrients being carbohydrates, fat, and protein, in the same kind of box. Proteins have about four kilocalories per gram. Carbohydrates have about four kilocalories of energy per gram. Fat has about nine kilocalories of energy per gram. It makes sense that if you believe in calories as be the be all and end all, right? You eat less calories, you lose weight. It makes sense that if you believe that, one should cut out fat because it's the most calorie dense food. So if you embrace that thinking, eating less calories makes sense. The problem is we are not what we eat. We are what our body makes out of what we eat. That's where the metabolic sickness comes in and that's being ignored by these guidelines. So as long as you eat and burn the same number of calories each day, your weight won't change. That's what, that's what they believe. Eat and, eat and burn the same number of calories a day and you'll be the same weight for the rest of your life. Uh, of course, the flip side, if you want to lose weight, you just need to exercise more, eat fewer calories, you'll lose weight. That, that's the formula. Change your behavior. If you want to lose weight, you just need to eat fewer calories. The problem is this doesn't actually work very well. First of all, I'm going to pick on exercise. Um, the American College of Sports Medicine published a statement, uh, a guideline on the role of exercise and weight loss in 2007. Again, I went to school starting in 2007 to 2011 for med school. Never heard about the study, only heard you need to encourage your patients to exercise more to lose weight. Well, this study clearly uh, states that if you are already overweight, uh, a moderate amount of exercise is not going to help you lose weight. We know that. We know that from good quality data. So I'm sorry to say it, if you're overweight, you're not going to lose weight by exercising unless you do vigorous exercise. That's what, that's what it takes. Um, they, when they talk about moderate, they're talking about 30 minutes a session, five days a week. All right? And that seems like a reasonable amount of exercise. You know? like it's, I, I think it'd be hard for a person who's overweight to go beyond that, m not for many reasons. One being that you know, that, weight is running on t that weight is running on top of knees. And that's not going to be very good for your knees. You're going you're gonna to struggle with that, right? So I don't actually, as part of our program, we don't encourage exercise immediately. It is part of what we believe is, we do believe, I'll be clear, that exercise is important, but we don't, uh, it's not part of our foundation in terms of where we start. Because we believe you need to get the weight off first to help your knees and your hips and stuff. Um, also, restricting calories has this funny phenomenon. When you eat less, you tend to be a little bit more hungry. When you eat less calories, you tend to be a bit more hungry. Has anyone, uh, no, you guys wouldn't have, you guys wouldn't have experienced this. Well, I'll just ask, has anyone ever been a bit hungry when they've dieted before? Anyone? No one. You guys have all, why are you here? Why are you guys here? You, you should. No, of course, when we cut calories, it, it makes us hungry. It, it does. Interestingly, one, one should ask the question, is it the coloring, cutting calories that, we're, that is making us hungry? Or is it something else about the way we're formulating our calorie restriction that is making us hungry? Um, again, going back to the video, it's the foods you're eating that are making you hungry. And of course, I believe that's the sugar and starch. Um, what we really need to be asking ourselves is not why are we depositing fat? Why are some people fat? Why are some people developing blood sugar? We should ask ourselves, and this is, this is from um, Gary Tobbs that I've, I've taken this idea. So thank you, Gary, for this. Um, is what controls fat storage? That's what we should be asking ourselves. What do, you, what do you guys think the answer is? What, what controls our fat storage? So hormones are these signaling molecules in our body. And there's a very important hormone that is at the locus of control for fat storage, and that is insulin. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. When your insulin levels are high, you're in fat storage mode. Your body's in fat. It is, it is saying to your body, fat cells do not mobilize energy. We're keeping the energy where it is, locked up in the fat cells. When insulin levels are high, we are saying, take that sugar out of the blood and turn it into fat. Get those levels down. We are storing away. We are storing energy away for another time in the future when we're going to need it. We are in energy storage mode when insulin is high. Now, the next question we need to ask ourselves is, why is insulin produced? What is insulin mobilized, uh, released from the pancreas in response to? Sugar. Exactly. Sugar and starch enter the small bowel 
and they stimulate the release of insulin from the pancreas. So it follows from that really simply that if you want to leave fat storage mode, what should you do? Eat less sugar and starch, exactly. It's honestly, it's that simple. I'm, I know it's that simple. I'm done. Good night. Nice to see you. No, <laughs> I'm not done because if it was that simple, you know, everyone would just be doing this. So let's go on a little bit longer. Um, we all know that person. On the flip side, we all know that person who can eat whatever she wants or whatever he wants and don't, don't seem to gain weight no matter what they eat. This is where there seems to be a bit of a genetic component here, doesn't, isn't there? Again, I don't know that we fully understand that. Now, when, I, when I say we, I mean me, but I also mean the collective medical establishment. Saying a guy is obese because he ate too much, <laughs> this is, a, I believe Gary Taub said this, is kind of like saying a guy is constipated because he's not pooping. <laughs> now, as far as I know, that's what constipation is. Constipation is not pooping. But you know what the problem with that is? It doesn't really tell us a whole lot about why he's constipated, right? And that's what we want to know. We want to know why he's constipated. We want to know how to fix it. So the question is, why is player 21 taller than player 51? <laughs> Absolutely, there's a huge genetic component there. What else? Is he taller because he ate more calories? But you know what? It takes calories to grow. So you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bet he did eat more calories. But is that why he's taller? Is it, is it the eating more? If I want to grow right now, should I just start like shoveling food into my face? Do, will that make me grow? No. no. <laughs> but no, because height is controlled by hormones. That's what controls growth. And this is true for your height and for the size of your fat cells. And again, we just need to ask ourselves, what hormone controls the growth of our fat cells? It's insulin. This is not rocket science. This is, this is I, I, I went back, because again, I've only been like a convert to this for the last three years. Before this, I was prescribing exercise more, eat less like everyone else. I went back to uh, an endocrinology textbook from a course I took in fourth year undergraduate university, so before I went to med school. Opened up the chapter on you know, how our body manages um, nutrient intakes of um, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And you know what? This is right out of that textbook. This idea that it is insulin that, that regulates the size and growth of our fat cells. And you know what? Not, didn't learn it in med school. Never came up. But it's insulin. What triggers the release of insulin? Let's do this again. Dietary carbohydrates. And interestingly, and this is, this is a point that Canadian Diabetes Association, or Diabetes Canada as they call themselves now, talk about a lot. The quality of the carbohydrates you eat matters. And I'm not saying that Diabetes Canada is out there telling people to eat sugar. They absolutely do not do that. They encourage patients to eat a very low sugar um, diet with complex carbohydrates that have fiber in them. So that is certainly the case. The more uh, fiber is removed from a carbohydrate or a starch, the more obesogenic that that, um, that, cal that uh, carbohydrate seems to be. The more it seems to generate that insulin response and the more fat seems to be made. Interestingly, there's a sugar called fructose. Now, fructose is naturally abundant in, in fruit. That's where it got its name. But there's a type of fructose that you may be consuming a lot of unwittingly. And it's something called high fructose corn syrup. Now, there may be other sources of high fructose products now too that are not just corn based. But high fructose corn syrup has been the preferred sugar sweetener in processed foods now for a number of uh, decades. Um, I read an article in the Canadian Medical Association Journal showing that our amount of high fructose corn syrup coming into Canada dramatically increased after NAFTA in the 1980s. Uh, it became uh, easier to get into our foods and it's easy in baked goods, it's in colas, it's in sugar sweetened beverages, uh, and it is highly obesogenic. And the reason is that fructose Unlike other sugars, the other sugars being um, um, galactose and uh, sucrose, are, uh, those other two can be stored as sugar. Whereas fructose, it only, metabolically, it can only be turned into fat. It goes to the liver and it's turned into fat. And we talked about how some of that fat can get caught up in the liver and cause liver sickness and these sorts of things, something I call metabolic sickness. So fructose seems to be particularly bad. The fruit, I'm not picking on fruit. You know, I, I, you gotta eat a lot of fruit to, to get, but the problem is, 
I, I, and I don't know exactly what the number would be. I'm not sure how many teaspoons of sugar are in, a, in, a, in an orange. No, that's not true, actually. In an apple, there are about 20 grams of sugar. I don't know exactly what proportion of that is fructose, but um, there's um, um, four grams per teaspoon of sugar. So anyway, you're, maybe you're having like five or four teaspoons or something like that of sugar, whatever, it doesn't matter. The, the apple is encased in fiber, and that fiber is an antidote to that sugar. And that's how nature made it. So if you eat the apple, you're certainly better off than if you had the apple juice. That's the point there, okay? You'll notice that in our, in our handbook, we do talk about restricting sugar, and I'm gonna get into that in a little bit more detail as we talk about what it takes to actually follow a ketogenic diet. But um, I, I'm not pecking on fruit right now. <clears throat> per se. Um, what is the real answer to the obesity epidemic? According to my, my oops, sorry, Mac. According to my thinking, I think that real answer is approach obesity not just as a behavioral problem. So let's get away from the World Health Organization and from the government of Canada's guidelines around what a healthy diet is and the solution to the obesity epidemic, focusing just on behavior. Let's see that um, we should be focusing uh, uh, on the metabolic derangement that drives the harmful eating behavior, okay? Because there's definitely a behavioral component here too. But you're driven to eat that because as you take in those carbs and the insulin levels go up and then the sugar levels go down and you have your craving, you eat more carbs, you make more fat, you have higher levels of insulin, your sugar levels go down, you want more. Our, uh, our our behavior is being driven by a metabolic sickness. And that seems to be ignored in our current approach to managing obesity and diabetes. And at the Metabolic Health Program, what we do is we help you break this cycle. And guess how many days, guys, it takes to break that cycle? 30 days? Anyone else? 20? Two. Two. What else? Anyone else? Six weeks? I, the answer is I don't exactly know, but I can tell you from following close to 300 patients, it's probably somewhere between two days to two weeks that you've broken that cycle of, 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 can we call this addiction? I don't know. I don't know if addiction is the right term. I'm not an addiction specialist. I'm not a psychiatrist, but maybe it's a physiologic dependence. Maybe that's, what we, maybe that's a better way to refer to it. But it seems to take about two days to two weeks. And the test, the test for that, I'm sorry, here. Yes, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I did a little caffeine purge a, a couple of years ago, and I, I, I would say, yeah, something like that. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's a good, a good comparison. Um, say two days, two weeks, and you'll know you've broken the cycle because you'll be standing in a coffee, a local coffee and donut vendor, vendor's foyer, looking at their beautiful display of donuts, <laughs> and you'll think to yourself, those look really nice. I like the look of the sprinkles. But you know what? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not craving one right now. And that's when, that's when you'll know you've broken that cycle. Two days to two weeks. That's all it takes. This is much better than things like alcohol or, or other sorts of addictive things like heroin. You know, these, these things are also considered to be addictive. I don't know. It takes a long time to break those cycles. This, this a lot less, a lot less. The message here, if you're a student, don't eat French fries full of carbohydrate starch. If you're... Uh, and, and certainly don't drink pop. The pop has got to be the worst. If you're a parent, don't give your kids juice. That's been Canadian Pediatric Society guideline for a number of years now. As long as I've been practicing, the Canadian Pediatric Society has been telling us, tell your patients, tell your parents, don't give your kids juice. Give them water and give them whole milk up until the age of two, and then 2% uh, milk is fine after that. So th they've been on this message for a long time. We recognize don't drink your sugar. Or... Don't make the mistake of assuming this thing on the right side is a, a healthy snack for our children. How many parents do you see giving, or I'm going to pick on the grandparents in the room for a second. You guys love to feed kids sugar. I know you do, because I, I, I won't say anything about my own life. I'll get in trouble. <laughs> this is not food on the right-hand side, and there are consequences. And maybe for the kid who's normal weight, nah, what's the, what's the harm, right? I don't know. Ask their teachers. I bet they'll tell you. Um, but this is, don't make the mistake of assuming this is food. Give them real food. If you're the Department of Public Health, my message to you if you're watching is stop promoting a low-fat diet because there's no evidence to support it. But I would encourage you to, to encourage low-sugar consumption. 
Maybe someday we'll see labels like this on beverages. This from a local donut and coffee vendor, this iced beverage capped with foam uh, um, contains 12 teaspoons. This, I think this is the, the, regular, the, the medium beverage contains 12 teaspoons of sugar. I don't know what kind of sugar that is. I've never looked into it. Maybe it's high fructose corn syrup. I'm not sure. I wonder if someday we'll have labels like this on these beverages like we have on cigarette packages now that say, warning. Do I have a label on this one? I don't. That's a, a future slide. But anyway, warning. This beverage contains 12 teaspoons of sugar. Let's do it, guys. 12 teaspoons. Ready? We're going to have a drink. We're going to put 12 teaspoons in. No, I won't make you go through it again. Can you imagine, though? You get to four and you'd be like, this is ridiculous. But no, I see students every day walk out of our hospital drinking these things and then going to class expecting their brains are going to function properly. Conclusion, sugar and refined carbohydrates make us fat. Fat deposits around our organs and makes our liver and our pancreas malfunction. And this can lead to diabetes if, you're eating, if this eating pattern continues over time. That's the important part there, if it continues over time. One, indulgence harms no one. Two, no harm. Three, no harm. A week's worth, probably no harm. We're talking about decades of exposure here, right? But this is the problem. We've had people, when they come here, they've had decades of exposure. Okay, a little wrap up here on the hormone obesity hypothesis. What hormone regulates the growth of our fat cells? That's right, insulin, not the thyroid hormone. Although these other hormones, I'll just say, are important. They are important, and actually this is where the interesting part of the medicine comes in. Sometimes these other hormones actually are very important in determining why some people struggle with their weight. And we get into that a little bit in the individual consultations. Uh, if you said insulin, you're correct. Up next, carboholics. <laughs> this is not a real medical diagnosis. There's no, there's no diagnosis of carbo carboholicness. But we need, I think we need to be considering addiction when it comes to recovering from, ob from obesity. And yes, I'm going to say it. One can recover from obesity. And maybe one can be a recovered carboholic. I don't know. Again, that, we don't talk about that in medicine. That's not, that's not something that other doctors talk about. I'm trying to be honest with you that a lot of this content is, is some of my own ideas, and then I'll also say to anyone else, you may say, hey, that was my idea. Okay, you, it's your idea then. But anyway, in, in medicine, we, we aren't talking about this to my knowledge. 